So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Welcome. Um, we just want to, um, I want to just kind of introduce myself first. My name is Stacy Oaks, and um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an organizer with 350 Seattle. Since 2017, I've been part of the resistance to Puget Sound Energy's um, controversial Tacoma LNG frack gas facility that's currently being built on the ancestral tide flats of the Puyallup tribe. And um, as, we be, as we begin our time here together, we just want to acknowledge that much of the organizing that we're doing in order to try and take our power back from Puget Sound Energy is actually taking place while we are guests on the lands and waters of the Coast Salish peoples. The original caregivers here since time immemorial and care that continues to this day. So I'd like to just take a moment and just raise my hands to the Coast Salish people in gratitude. And, and we thank you again for this opportunity to, to work towards a better future together. We also want to extend a big thank you to all of our co-hosts that have helped in one way or another to make this series possible or to help share it out. And we want to do a big thank you also to everyone that's taking their precious time in order to spend, <laughs> spend this time learning more about Puget Sound Energy, whether that's here with us in person or the folks that are watching this later as a recording. And of course, we also want to do a big thank you to our wonderful presenters that we have for tonight. We have several presenters. Um, we have Jamie Potasek. And Jamie's a volunteer organizer with the Sunrise Movement. Her work is currently based in the Sunrise Seattle Hub, but she also runs trainings for the movement nationally. With a degree in climate science and environmental studies, Jamie spends her working hours as the lead field organizer for Future Wise's statewide campaign to update Washington's Growth Management Act with legislative sessions. We're also joined by Joshua Rubenstein, a volunteer with 350 Seattle, an environmental educator who likes reading legislation and RCWs. We're joined by Neil Anderson, who's a volunteer with 350 Seattle and Sierra Club, and who's been working to stop frac gas infrastructure projects. So a big thank you to everyone. And um, I'm just gonna remind us one more time that we are recording. So if you don't want your face to be seen, so please have your video off. And to also note that the upside of having this recorded is that we can watch these later. So if you missed either of our first two events in the series, that is available in our resources doc, which is gonna get dropped in the chat if you wanna check those out um, in your time that you have. We are gonna take Q&A at the end of the presentation. So feel free to save your questions or if you'd like to just write them down whenever you think of them in the chat, they potentially might get answered in the chat or we'll go back and kind of dig them out when we get to Q&A time. And um, in order to kick us off today, we're gonna to go ahead and, and have Joshua start the presentation. Hey all, so thank you Stacy, for introducing us and welcome to our Washington's climate goals and how PSC is undermining them. Uh, Washington has set some climate goals based on various groups. Um, we've got the IPCC that has, uh, that does research internationally and the UW Climate Impacts Group is researching um, a lot more specific to Washington State. And as I'm sure you all know, the Paris Climate Accord sets goals of uh, well under two degrees warming globally, ideally less than, ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. And so in Washington, we have RCW 70A 45.020, um, which is our state's legislation that says why it's important we lower carbon emissions and sets goals. Um, and so specifically that legislation uh, points to increasing days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, leading to heat related illness, warmer streams, and frequent algal blooms, a decreased snowpack leading to reduced water storage, irrigation shortages, and winter and summer recreation losses. We have more stream flow in the winter, so we'll have more risk of flooding, and lower stream flow in the summer, so less hydropower in the summer, conflicts over water resources, and negative effects on salmon populations, and an increase of almost one and a half feet in sea level, uh, leading to coastal flooding, inundation, of our infrastructure and damage and bluff erosion. And all of these impacts that the legislation points out will happen in, um, this is what they're predicting for 2050. So not that far into the future. And 
to uh, try to prevent as much of these impacts as we can. And obviously there are many more. Um, the state has set goals that we will reach our 1990 levels of emissions, which were around 90 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And if you have questions about that, we can happy to go into that, what a carbon dioxide equivalent is later, um, but it's a measure of greenhouse gases. And um, so by this, by last year, we were supposed to reach 1990 levels. In 20, 2030, we're supposed to reach 55% of 1990 levels. By 2040, we were supposed to reach 30% of 1990 levels. And by 2050, we're supposed to reach 5% of 1990 levels of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna be talking about our local fossil fuel company, which is Puget Sound Energy. Uh, they like to claim their utility, but um, here we have an image of their new Tacoma LNG um, fracked methane facility. And uh, if you can click again, we'll get a couple more images. Um, here is Coal Strip, which is one of their largest sources of electricity in Montana. And they recently tried to keep that operating for even longer. Um, luckily, that was prevented, but we would like them to shut it down quickly. Here's an image of gas fracking. So much of PSD's business is methane, fracked gas. And um, though they like to present that as a, a climate remedy, it is actually one of, it's a fossil fuel and it's one of the biggest sources of emissions of carbon climate pollution in Washington state. And one more picture. And here is a, a fracked gas electric generation facility um, that PSE owns. I believe this is the Mint Farm facility. And so much of our electricity um, on PSE's grid is coming from these gas facilities. Next slide, please. So here's just a quick graph of PSE's fuel mix. They have 56% um, natural gas and coal. So that's 56% 50 of PSE's electricity is coming from fossil fuels in a region with some of the most abundant clean electricity in the country. Um, just a side note, you might notice that all of our electricity in this beautiful graph is green. Uh, if you were at our first presentation a couple of weeks ago, you might recognize this as greenwashing. Um, you'll see that as a pattern with PSE. Next slide, please. So here's a graph um, of all of Washington's climate pollution, all of our greenhouse gases from 2010 to 2018. And over those nine years, Puget Sound Energy comprised 16% of all of the fossil fuel pollution in all the climate pollution in Washington state. That's one company, 16% of the pollution. And that doesn't even include, PSE does not count their upstream emissions. So one of the worst um, parts of fracked gas is the fact that you release methane, which is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas into the atmosphere at every stage in the process. And PSE doesn't count that lost methane until it gets into their uh, distribution system. Next slide, please. So that last graph included transportation, which is one of the largest sources of emissions in Washington state. When we take out transportation and look at all of Washington's non-transportation emissions, PSE is a full 30, almost 30% 30 of emissions in Washington state. So this is, one company that is hugely responsible for all the problems that we face trying to decarbonize. And as you're gonna see from our later presenters, it's gonna be a big challenge getting them to do the work that they need to do. Next slide, please. And then just to drive it home even further, um, this orange here is PSE's gas emissions in 2019, just from their uh, natural gas utility, their methane utility. And next to it is our goal for 2050 in Washington. And you might think, okay, so they just need to lower that all the way to zero um, and everything else might all need to lower all the way to zero and we could meet our goals. But as you'll see in our next slide, they actually intend to raise the amount of gas that they use by, in the next 25 years. So by 2050, PSD will increase their, um, their gas utility sales. And as a result, even if everything else, including their electricity, went to zero, we would still not achieve our goals. So that is the scale at which PSE is uh, destroying our climate. Um, and just one more thing to drive it home. Last year, uh, customer energy use. Next slide. Uh, 
Last year, customer energy use went down by 3.8% and their emissions went up by 6.4%, which is the wrong way. And it has been for decades. So a quick case study of why this matters. If a city like Bellevue intends to lower their greenhouse gas emissions, um, they will need to work with PSE because PSE provides all of their uh, methane and all of their electricity. And so a full 45% of uh, Bellevue's greenhouse gas, em gas emissions are directly coming from Puget Sound Energy. And they're simply not gonna be able to meet their climate goals without PSE also lowering their emissions. But when you talk to PSC about this, they whine and they obstruct. So I was at a meeting with PSC's largest customers a couple of years ago um, in 2019 when I was working for Crystal Mountain. And when asked about it, they presented, they presented their, seat, their Clean Energy Transformation Act plans. They basically said, we don't plan to do it. Um, we have lots of off ramps and that it'll take, we'll have to build too much electricity to go clean and it's too expensive. Um, but we actually really need that clean energy. Um, not only do we need to have no fossil fuel emissions um, from our electricity supply, but we could also use our electricity, uh, extra electricity for things like clean hydrogen, which has current bipartisan support in the Washington state legislature. We can power electric vehicles, we could electrify buildings, we can pump hydro, we can build batteries. There are lots of things we can do with extra electricity. We can uh, integrate with grids in other parts of the, the country. Um, so this is a, an, empty, an empty complaint, but their alternative is fossil fuels over and over. And Stacy, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Hey, thanks. So <clears throat> just kind of a quick reminder, um, you know, as we see what, how big of an influence Puget Sound Energy is on Washington's climate, meeting climate uh, goals and progress, Something that we have to consider when we're trying to figure out, you know, do we think they're actually going to get help get us there is their patterns of behavior um, and some of their business practices, which like like Joshua already said, you know, they are a fossil fuel company. They are profit motivated in order to try and get profits for their shareholders and their CEOs. And so they don't necessarily have actual good motivation in order to uh, bring down our emissions. And when we look at those patterns of behavior, we have to look at them as a fossil fuel company. And what we're seeing there is Puget Sound Energy and other fossil fuel companies are going to be doing things like greenwashing, which again is where you're trying to make something sound more environmentally friendly than it is. Our, our first event went into a lot of detail about the greenwashing that PSC does. So I do it, um, urge you to check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, We've also talked previously about Puget Sound Energy isn't being really transparent with data. So when we try to figure out how did they come up with a number for demand or a greenhouse gas analysis number, um, or even uh, wanna be able to see the safety analysis that they said they've had done for a facility, uh, they go to great lengths not to share those things. And um, some of the links they go to even involve suing people who are from the communities where these infrastructure projects are coming into. And we saw that in Tacoma, and I assume that you're gonna find patterns of that happening in, in other projects as well. Um, something else um, from um, some other things that they've been doing from that we see with the Tacoma LNG facility, which is a liquefied natural gas facility, again, being built on the ancestral tide flats of the Puyallup tribe is that they are not actually paying attention to the, the Medicine Creek Treaty, which is, which is involved for that area. Um, there's supposed to be consultation. There's also supposed to, um, there's also supposed to be able to ensure a uh, right for fishing in usual and accustomed places and that there will be fish there to be fished. And so <clears throat> we see that they, with the, with the controversial Tacoma, that not only are they not caring about the treaty violations that are involved in the way that they've been going about building this facility, but they didn't even wait for permits to start building. So they've been building that project. They built it for two years before they actually had permits to do so. And so we see this bully mentality and behavior that goes along with it. So when we see all of these things, 
you know, it really comes into question, do we think we can trust them <laughs> to uh, magically decarbonize soon? And uh, do we think we can just kind of like trust that, um, that they're going to because we see pictures of windmills and uh, cute little cartoon animals in all of their, in all of their advertising. But what we should really be looking at to find out what they're doing is some of their plans. So Puget Sound Energy has a 20 year plan that they look at and we're gonna um, hand it over to Neil and he's gonna dig in a little bit more to what they're actually planning to do regardless of what they put in their advertising. Thanks, Stacey. Um, yeah, you heard from uh, both Josh and Stacey uh, a little bit of cynicism that uh, maybe PSE uh, is not gonna do the right thing. Um, and so why don't we look at their plan and, and see whether or not that's justified. Uh, so they do have to come out with a 20 year plan every couple of years. They have to say how they're intending to source electricity. Um, and so I wanna start with one good thing that they did uh, that's in their plan, which is getting off coal by 2025. Um, so that's great, but I'm not gonna send them a thank you card for that because I've been uh, working on PSC uh, electricity mix issues for the past four years, and they really resisted this. They wanted to do anything to avoid shutting down that coal plant. Uh, originally, just four years ago, their plan, their 20-year plan said, we're going to keep running this until the mid-2040s. Um, so they had no intention of quitting. And then uh, they, were, they were forced to, finally, the state legislature said, if you're not going to do it voluntarily, like you should, we're going to require you to get rid of it. So it's built into uh, CETA, which is the Clean Energy Transformation Act that was passed a couple of years ago that mandated that we clean up uh, electricity. It was mandated that they get rid of coal by 2025. And so even then, they tried to go about it in a way that um, would have allowed the pollution to continue. The, the clear intent by Washington voters um, in, uh, in getting that passed was we want to address climate change. We want to reduce emissions. And so PSE said, well, the law only says that we're not allowed to use it, but we can sell it to somebody else who will. And so they tried to sell it to another company that was gonna run it into the 2040s. And luckily the Utility and Transportation Commission denied that uh, in part because of pressure like the people uh, from, from uh, people like the ones who are here the ones who are paying attention and who are speaking out against PSE once they find out there are opportunities for public engagement. And people have been taking advantage of that and going and saying, uh, this is not in our state's interest. And in this case, the, the regulators listened and they didn't allow PSE to do that. Um, so that was, <laughs> that's the one good thing that they did, <laughs> which was comply with the law. Uh, but, Gas is really their industry. Besides uh, electricity, they, they sell gas directly. And their previous director was a member of the, uh, I think the president of the American Gas Association. So they are essentially a fossil fuel company. They're a gas company. And they're predicting over the next 20 years, no change in gas, which is really not possible. Um, the it's not possible from a climate standpoint because the IPCC has said we have to get to zero within 30 years, which means we need to be on a pretty steep decarbonization path. We need to be getting rid of gas as fast as possible. And to say they're not gonna do it for 20 years means they're, they're planning to just not um, meet that goal. But it's not just uh, a, a climate goal set by scientists. It's also the law that we have to be off gas by 2045, completely off. And we have to be 80% clean by 2030. And so if they're saying there's going to be no change over the next 20 years, they're saying they're not going to comply with that law. And they're able to get away with that because uh, when, when the CETA law was passed, they petitioned to, to reduce the enforcement for that. So that law doesn't have the teeth that it should. It should impose steep fines, and it doesn't. So they watered down that law so that they could get away with continuing to pollute. And we're seeing from this plan that that's exactly what they intend to do. So there's the gas for electricity, and then they're also building up gas for, um, 
uh, for other markets. They're looking for other markets to sell gas in besides just electricity. One of those is Tacoma LNG, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what would we like to see in uh, an IRP? Uh, we definitely like to see that steady decline in gas generation. If we're gonna get to zero in 30 years, uh, we need to be getting rid of probably um, almost half of that by 2030. That would be in line with the IPCC goals also. Um, it didn't just say that it, we have to be at zero by 2050, but it said we have to be halfway there by 2030. And so uh, for us to comply with that, we would need to be, this 20 year plan would need to say that we would be getting to 50% in 10 years and then even less in another 10. And they're not, they're not doing that at all. Um, but it's not enough to just be on a linear downslope to zero within 30 years. That's what the entire world needs to do for every source of emissions. And in the Western world, we, we have the resources to be able to move faster than that. And not only that, electricity is the easiest to do decarbonize. That's where you start. That's the one where we already have solutions. And the other solutions for clean electricity. So to solve transportation, we need to electrify it and that electricity needs to be clean. For heating and cooking right now, a lot of that is done with gas. That needs to be electrified and that electricity needs to be clean. So clean electricity is an enabler for every other type of decarbonization. So it's, it's not only that they're not doing their share with electricity, but we're relying on them to clean up their act so that we can clean up the other sectors. And so it's extremely problematic that they're not doing that. Um, and then, so yeah, no new gas projects also. Obviously, if we're trying to get rid of gas from the electricity sector, we can't be building up gas projects um, for other markets as well. So Tacoma LNG is clearly uh, out of line with what we need to be doing. And then something else they need to be doing is investments in energy storage and transmission, because those are the keys to cleaning up electricity. We need to um, we need to have ways to store energy because uh, sometimes it's not produced by wind or solar, depending on the weather conditions. And so the way to get around that is to have sufficient storage. And so that takes um, investments just to buy the storage capacity itself, but also we need improvements. That's one area where we need technological improvements. And so we need to be investing in that right now so that those improvements can start happening because that is the one difficult part about cleaning up electricity is um, getting uh, increased capacity in, store, in energy storage. And so that's something that they need to be researching and funding uh, right now so that we have those solutions. Transmission also, that's the other way that you solve um, the uh, intermittency of electricity. Uh, you could imagine a scenario where in all of Washington state, you don't have uh, wind or solar power available. You have a high pressure system, so no wind and it's a cloudy day. Um, and so you just don't have the wind or solar and that could go on for a couple of days. And the way you get around that is you connect to other markets. If we're connected to say Montana, we might have that weather pattern going on here, but they're not gonna have the same thing happening there. They're gonna have wind. Um, and so we, we can uh, buy from them when we need it and we can send electricity to them when we're overproducing. Um, and we wanna be connected to Oregon and California, same thing. Uh, if there's a weather pattern in one region that can be compensated for in other regions and that prevents you from having to buy as much storage. So that's a way to make that a cheaper option. And they're clearly not interested in doing that because that uh, the sale I was telling you about with the coal plant that they um, that they attempted, they were going to sell the transmission line along with that. So they were going to sell the very things that we need to decarbonize electricity in the right way. Um, so all of their, all of the moves they've made and all of the forecasting they're doing shows that they have no intention of decarbonizing. And then the other thing that we'd like to see in an IRP is analysis of how you decarbonize, because it is complicated. And I think that's a lot of why they're resisting doing this. Wind and solar themselves are, are cheaper than fossil fuels, but it is outside of their comfort zone. 
it's, it's a lot more difficult to, um, to source electricity from renewables because you've got to take into account things like, okay, what are the weather patterns? Um, what are, are there going to be times when we have high demand relative to our ability to produce um, electricity? With, with gas, those problems aren't, uh, they're just not a concern because you can just, it's, it's kind of like the, the gas dial on your stove. You can just um, turn it up and you get more immediately, very easy. So they like that. It's, um, it's easy for them to work with because if they need more electricity, they just start burning more gas. And with renewables, it is more complicated. You have to think about what are the ideal locations to site these? Um, what are the prevailing weather patterns that we're likely to run into? What's the demand in that region? What other regions um, can we connect to? What are their weather patterns? And all of their control systems are designed right now for fossil fuels because that's what they've been using for the past hundred years. And so they'll have to redesign those. So there is a lot of work involved um, and they need to do a lot of analysis to figure out how to deliver clean energy. And that's what we would expect to see in an IRP. We would just expect to see that analysis of, okay, how do you do this? Because it is a complicated problem and it's something that they need to start working on immediately. And it's something that is, is difficult and they're not used to it. And right now they're resisting it. And we really need to push them to say, um, no, you need to deliver clean energy and you need to figure out how. And then something else uh, outside of what they're intending to, to spend on is the opportunity cost of, of what they are spending on. So for example, Tacoma LNG is, uh, is a side project for them. It's not related to electricity. Um, well, they, they say it is, there, there is one tie-in, but primarily 95% of it is for profit um, for the shipping industry. And so what they're doing is they are spending $300 million um, in order to reap the profits from that and not doing anything to advance the, uh, the goals of clean electricity. And so that's $300 million that should have gone into all the things that I just described, um, investments in storage and transmission, doing that analysis on how you decarbonize. They're, instead of spending the money on figuring out how we get there, they're spending it on this profit-making venture that is really just a substitution of one fossil fuel for another. So not only are they not doing the right thing, but they are throwing away money that they could be using to do the right thing. And then the other thing that's really disastrous about what their intentions are around gas is that it drives fracking. And fracking is uh, terrible for the climate. Um, it's it's um, actually about the worst thing you can do for the climate because of the methane leaks that Josh was talking about. But also the environmental harms to people near the fracking sites um, are just abominable. If you really look into um, what kind of uh, pollution is coming out of, of those sites. And um, it's a pretty uh, long topic to go into, but they, it's, it's carcinogenic for a reason. When they're fracking, they're driving water down into um, the shale formations and cracking it apart. And if bacteria starts to grow, then they can't pump the gas out. So they have to create a, a toxic mixture to kill off any life from being able to form within that rock. And that, uh, and that water comes back out. It, it doesn't stay down in the rock. About half of it comes back to the surface and has to be driven to disposal sites where there can be spills. And of course you can have spills at the site itself. So anybody living nearby has a chance of being exposed to those chemicals. And so I wanna turn it over now to, uh, to Jamie, who has actually lived near one of these fracking sites and can tell you a little bit more about what, what the human cost is of what PSE's behavior is driving. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Neil. Uh, did you wanna actually touch on, on, this, on this slide a little bit before I take oh, over? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the Tacoma LNG facility. This is the one that I was saying is their profit-making venture to supply to the shipping industry. Um, and uh, so you've got all the same uh, local uh, toxicity impacts 
um, that you do at fracking sites where um, there are there are hazardous air emissions and potential water contamination. But also one of the horrible things about this is that it's being built um, on what had been Puyallup uh, reservation land. So they, they took the waterways and, and Stacy was telling you that the Medicine Creek Treaty granted them access to their accustomed fishing locations. Well, they took the water that they had fished in and dredged contaminated soil and covered it up and said, um, well, I know you used to fish here, but now it's it's land and we're gonna use this to build a polluting refinery right beside where you live. And so your kids who are going to school are now breathing the toxins from this, which used to be um, where you would go and and be able to fish as the, as the treaty gave you the right to do. So it's one of the worst injustices you can imagine where they're taking away their land and then building a polluting facility uh, that is uh, toxifying the air that they have to breathe. So um, let's see. Yeah, so I don't want to go into it uh, too much more because I do want to talk about fracking. We've talked about um, some of this in the past. And in our next webinar, that is going to be all about the uh, indigenous sovereignty rights. Um, so please come to that one. But, uh, but I do want to turn over now to talk a little bit more about fracking because I'm not sure everybody realized just how, um, how severe the environmental impacts are from fracking. Awesome, thanks Neil. Um, so before I kind of get into a little bit of just of my experience and what I saw in my community um, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, I do just wanna recap a little bit. As, as we've learned, PSC's current strategy is to continue investing in fracked gas, which is gonna severely undermine the work that we really actively need to be doing to transition to renewable sources of energy and curb a climate crisis that's already out of control. And with the construction of the Tacoma LNG plant, as Neil was just saying, we will be not only further from reaching our greenhouse reduction goals, we'll also be exposing our communities to really harmful and dangerous emissions. And not only will we be paying for this facility with our health, um, but PSC residential gas and electric customers are gonna be on the hook uh, for 43% of the construction costs, even though only 2% of the gas um, over the facility's life will go to residential customers. And as taxpayers, we'll, we will also pay if, um, and this if is definitely more likely a when, um, when it happens. The insurance on this Tacoma LNG facility is extremely low for the damage that could happen to the facility itself, let alone loss of life, property, and nearby business. The facility is also located on the, on the Cascadia earthquake fault line on soil prone to liquefaction and has not had a meaningful safety analysis. And because the lease on this infrastructure lasts decades, 30 to 40 years, we are essentially locking ourselves in to emissions from fracked gas for the length of that lease. Um, and as Neil was kind of alluding to, there are some really complex environmental justice issues um, sort of beyond tribal rights and, and the impacts on, on our local communities in Washington that building a terminal for fracked gas in Tacoma would have. Um, so like I said, like while, while there are definitely environmental hazards and risks to our communities in Washington and in Tacoma that the construction of this facility would present, there's also uh, quite a bit of cognitive dissonance at play when you consider the fact that the state of Washington is allowing such a facility to be built, even though we've actually banned the practice of fracking itself within our state boundaries. So essentially what we're saying is that we think hydraulic fracking is too dangerous to subject our communities to, but we're still gonna utilize gas that has been fracked from other states and from Canada. Um, and this pushes the burden of environmental, social and economic costs of the fracking process itself on communities in other states. Um, so states like my home in Pennsylvania, I grew up on one of the biggest deposits of Marcellus shale uh, in the country. And when I was kind of coming through my adolescence, it was when the fracking industry was really starting to boom. And this had really profound impacts on my community and the communities around me. Um, we saw our drinking water supplies contaminated with things like benzene, toluene, formaldehyde, and other dangerous contaminants. Uh, wastewater was dumped into rivers and streams. Forests were clear cut for gas wells 
and we've seen increases in dangerous methane emissions. Um, there have been blowouts from gas explosions and communities near fracking sites uh, experience really severe health impacts and often suffer both short and long-term negative impacts on their local economies from these companies coming in. Um, so given all those realities, like it makes a lot of sense that Washington is saying no fracking in our backyard. Um, but the construction of this site in Tacoma uh, is essentially us paying for these industries to continue to destroy the environment and communities in other parts of this country. Um, that is not only sad, but it is really wrong. Um, and it's really something that we should all be fighting against. Um, you can go to that next slide. And as we've mentioned already, um, PSC goes to very great lengths um, to use propaganda to misinform the public about the realities of their operation. Um, they are expert greenwashers. Uh, for those of you who weren't at our previous presentation, greenwashing is the process of conveying a false impression or providing misleading information about how a company's products are more environmentally sound than they actually are. So we're gonna just watch this really short and quick clip uh, to take a look at what PSC's greenwashing looks like. I can't hear this sound on that, but. Well, hopefully you guys got the gist. I don't, I don't know if the sound wasn't working for other people, but. Um, no, yeah, sorry about that. It wasn't working because when I shared this, I didn't realize we had audio content. I would need to share it in a different way. Yeah. Um, I can do that really quickly if you'd like. Sure, let's, yeah, why not? Let's just do it real quick. Your Northwest clean energy future has already begun with today's natural gas. Supporting the growth of wind, solar, and renewable natural gas, the future of clean energy is here for you. Learn how at PEPNW.org. <laughs> um, yeah, that just makes me nauseous. Uh, pretty genius marketing uh, and pretty insidious marketing. Um, and that is what they're putting a lot of their time and energy into doing. Um, PSC also pours money into lobbying to buy out our politicians in the state. In 2019, PSC spent over $854,000 on lobbying of just the Washington state legislature and governor. Um, so that does not include money also put in uh, to local governments. Between 2008 and 2018, uh, PSC spent $665,000 on campaign contributions in Washington state. Um, on every scale um, of the government. Uh, in both cases, they outspent Amazon on what they're putting into our elections and our politics. PSC is also a member of something called the Partnership for Energy Progress, uh, which is an industry front group, a coalition of companies like PSC that launches pro-gas PR campaigns. Uh, if you wanna go to that next slide. Your Northwest clean. <laughs> Um, yeah, and PEP, among uh, many other immoral activities, is the group behind a propaganda campaign that's directed towards children, the generation that uh, already stands to suffer the most from the climate crisis. Um, so this is just a screenshot from their website, um, and it is dedicated entirely to making natural gas um, seem like a fun and exciting thing for kids to learn about. Um, they have greenwashed educational materials, games, and an entire section that is pushing career opportunities in the gas industries on kids. Um, again, just like really disgusting, really horrible. I like recommend that you go to this website and just click around because um, it is just, yeah, it is a fascinating study of just human psychology and what we're willing um, to ignore um, for profit. And if you go to that next slide, um, and all of this um, is to distract us from the reality of what these companies uh, call natural gas production really looks like. And there's absolutely nothing natural about it. All these companies do are endanger communities, climate and environment for myopic, profit -seek for myopic and profit seeking interests of companies like PSC that are way more concerned about their bottom line than human and environmental health and safety. Um, and I think, uh, at least for me, maybe the most infuriating part 
of this entire thing is that we have the knowledge and technology to make a clean and just energy transition. Um, but we need the political and social will to make it happen. And that is really difficult with companies like PSE sowing disinformation and buying up politicians. You can go to the next slide. It might go through if you go there. And that's why it's vital um, that we're all here and that we do everything we can to expose companies like this for what they really are and forge a better path forward. So we are going to get into a couple of strategies that we as citizens can be pushing for to take back our power in determining our energy and our climate future. Next slide, please. Um, so first there are public utility districts. A public utility district is a community owned locally regulated utility created by a vote of the people. And PUDs are governed by nonpartisan locally elected boards of commissioners and the commissioners are responsible for setting rates and for overseeing the operation of the PUDs. Um, they meet in open sessions where members of the public can observe and participate in the decision making process. Washington already has 28 public utility districts. So this is not a new or a radical idea. PUDs tend to have a much lower percentage of fossil fuels used in their energy generation mix. Most PUDs in Washington uh, currently purchase electricity wholesale from Bonville Power Administration. That's a federal agency uh, that generates um, all of its, I think all, if not most of its power from hydroelectric dams. Um, PUDs are not profit motivated, so they tend to be less expensive and make better investments that actually benefit community uh, and make good long term decisions. Um, so East King County is currently preparing to put an initiative on the 2022 ballot to create an electric PUD, um, which would give PSC the boot and take um, community power back in terms of the decisions we make with our energy sources. We know PSC is gonna fight back really hard and dump tons of money into trying to defeat the measure and spread fear among residents that switching to a PUD will somehow mean more expensive monthly bills. Uh, so we'll really need a lot of folks helping uh, to share the truth to East King County residents. Um, and I think we should be dropping a link in the chat of ways to plug in. Thurston County uh, was also attempting to put in an electric PUD initiative on the 2020 ballot. Um, but had to put signature gathering on pause due to the pandemic. Um, and you can learn more at, about that at powertothepublic.org. Um, next slide, please. Um, then we have uh, a focus on healthier homes and clean buildings. So buildings are the fastest growing source of carbon emissions in Washington state, uh, with this increase largely attributable to the use of fossil gas in homes and buildings. Um, we also know that cooking um, with gas stoves, uh, just for an example, is extremely unhealthy. Um, kids in homes with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop symptoms of asthma than in homes with electric cooktops. Um, so this is not just about climate, this is about human health. And electrifying buildings is, is re a really key component uh, of the most cost-effective path to achieving deep greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So HB 1084, also known as the Healthy Homes and Clean Buildings Bill is moving through the state legislature as we speak. It was just pa passed out of the House Committee on Environment and Energy and is now in the House Appropriations Committee, uh, which will decide whether or not and how to provide the funding necessary for this bill to move forward uh, to the House floor. Um, so this bill would require that all new buildings in Washington be zero carbon by 2030 and seek to eliminate fossil fuel consumption in existing buildings by 2050. Um, electrification of new buildings is not only gonna impact climate, but will have really significant impacts on environmental justice, human health and safety, and result in decreased consumer costs and likely increases in job creation. So this is really, really important legislation to support, um, especially because we know that PEP uh, with substantial financial support from PSE is already fighting back hard against local efforts to have uh, cleaner buildings requiring new construction to use electricity instead of gas. Um, so we should be getting some links in the chat uh, that will give you more information on this legislation and ways to engage. Uh, go to that next slide. 
Um, the Department of Ecology is also rewriting the rules for calculating the climate impacts of new projects, and they'll be holding public hearings on this. Um, so if they use the best available science, the fossil fuel industry will have to disclose how harmful uh, to the climate these projects really are. As we've seen in the controversial analysis of the Tacoma LNG, our current rules have really serious flaws. These projects don't just harm the climate, they also poison the air and water of nearby communities. Um, and so now that the Department of Ecology is reconsidering how to evaluate fossil fuel projects, this is really our chance to reframe the conversation. Accurate climate impact assessment is important, but we also must take into account the human cost to frontline communities. The new rules should force industry to evaluate and disclose those costs as well. So there's a public hearing in May, uh, and we're really working to empower folks to take part. So we encourage you to join us um, for the events that you can see on this slide. And I'm sure more information will be coming uh, on ways to get involved and, and, and prepared to impact this process. You can go to that next slide. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about Tacoma LNG, uh, I highly recommend taking part in this conversation on protecting culture and tribal treaty rights that's happening on Sunday, February 21st. This is being put on by The Conversation, a social justice organization in Tacoma uh, that has been part of the Tacoma LNG resistance. It will go over the impacts of polluting industries on tide flats um, through stories by this really incredible lineup of speakers. Um, so we should be dropping the registration link in the chat if it's not already there. Um, and you can go to that next slide. And finally, uh, you can participate in PSE's public hearing on their 20 year energy plan uh, to tell them it is just a load of BS and that they need to put their money where their mouth is and start investing in renewables instead of expanding their fracked gas infrastructure. Uh, so we'll have more information on the way uh, on how you can participate. But for now, you can send in a written comment and there's links to that in the chat and also in the resource document that y'all should have access to. Um, you can go to that next slide. Um, so with all of these ideas and initiatives swirling around in our heads, I would love to just do um, some collective envisioning of what we want for our energy future. Um, so it could be you no know, profits for fossil fuels, no new fossil fuel infrastructure, PUDs that are easier to create. Um, what are your dreams for our energy future? We're gonna just take a couple minutes um, for folks to share in the chat what your ideas are, what you wanna see uh, from our energy infrastructure in the coming years. Um, so we'll just take a couple minutes if you have any ideas, any inspiration um, that you wanna share in the chat, we'll see what kind of list we can come up with. Clean energy for Bellevue. Energy that still makes it possible for Stacy's granddaughter to breathe, live, and drink clean water. Fossil fuel free transportation infrastructure, agreed. More microgrid with local generation. Transitions to electric energy generation easier and affordable. Divestment of taxpayer funds from anything fossil fuel related. Respect for treaty rights. I love that, Patrick. A, distri a distributed energy grid that's reliable and affordable. I agree with that as well, Don. Removing profit motive from essential services for sure. The energy generation of infrastructure that's designed to give more than it takes and center the public health and well being as the number one metric for success. Well, that just sounds great. Um, so feel free to keep those ideas coming. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Joshua uh, again to lead us in a song that he has written. By way of introduction, Joshua had professional voice lessons for one whole semester in college. He is a budding guitar player with dreams of being a campfire folk song hero. In fact, some call him the literal unsung campfire song hero of our generation. Um, so this is a sing along. Remember that you're on mute, uh, so don't be afraid to belt it out because none of us will be able to hear you. Uh, anyways, so with that, I'll pass it over to Josh for our sing-along. Wow, Jamie, thank you for a glowing introduction, reintroduction. 
Um, and I really encourage you all to sing along. That was heavy. That was um, a lot of uh, dark information. And Yale, I do need the words, please. Um, if you can share the slides again. Great. So this song is to the tune of She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain. And I hope you all join me. There are local fossil fuel company, PSC. There are local fossil fuel company, PSC. Oh, they love to frack gas and they frack us in the ass. There are local fossil fuel company, PSC. Washington has greenhouse gas emissions goals that PSC's actions and plans simply ignore. They are building LNG plants, giving politicians big grants while we ratepayers just pour money down their hole. Next slide. PSE is planning on more fracked pollution and they know it prevents Washington's solution. So they lie about their impact, greenwash to obscure and distract while they profit from their climate execution. Now we must take back our power finally with healthy homes, fossil fuel rules, and PUDs. Please comment on the IRP because following CETA they will not be. There are local fossil fuel monopoly PSE. I hope you all sang along. Woo! That was awesome, Joshua. Thank you so much for sharing your original song with us. <clears throat> I know that'll be stuck in my head later. I don't know about anybody else, but I'll be thinking that to myself, trying to go to sleep. <laughs> Please also feel free to add verses, uh, broaden our uh, repertoire. If you have some other PSC songs you'd like to rewrite, uh, would love to see some more variety there. And to everybody asking for those lyrics, um, the slides will be in our resources doc within a couple days. So yes, if you go into the resources doc and look in the slides, you will be able to have a copy of these amazing lyrics to be able to sing again later with your friends. No singles until I can sit around a campfire with people safely. So, oh, um, so we're doing great on time. We figured we'd be able to stay and take questions till about 7.15. I know some folks will have to hop right off at seven in just a minute here, but again, the recording does keep um, our question answer period. So if you end up missing some of that, but are interested, it'll be in the recording. Um, so we'd like to go ahead and take take questions from folks. If you, um, if you have a question you wanna say out loud versus throw in the chat, um, if you wanna try and use the raise hand function, um, which is, um, should just be down probably on the bottom of most people's screens there. Um, if you're not sure how to use that and you want to go with the old school raise hand of doing some of this till we notice you, that's okay too. <laughs> and then also feel free to drop your, your questions in the chat. Um, I know we had a few that were dropped earlier. A lot of them did get answered in the chat, but I think we had a few that maybe didn't. So we could always start there while folks are, are thinking about their questions. And along with our panelists, we have a few other experts that are kind of in the house with us. So, um, so we, we encourage some of our other expert partners to feel free to jump in when a question comes up, like Don there. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead and um, hop in Don with your question. Yeah, actually, it's a, a little more of a comment. Um, I know these presentations were probably put together before uh, PSC. We had another IRP meeting of stakeholders, and anybody can can attend these things. It's a webinar where PSC, you know, gives us information about their ongoing uh, integrated resource plan efforts. And so the funny thing is, the 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 um, plan that they dropped on January fourth is only partially complete. It was supposed to be, you know, pretty, pretty much there. But uh, now uh, comments are starting to get closed down and they still haven't finished figuring out what, what the final plan is. But we were shocked yesterday when PSC showed us a, um, a, a chart that shows, a graph that shows how they're going to meet the CETA uh, cost caps. So basically, CETA, the Clean Energy Transformation Act, 
allows PSE to spend 2% more each year to pursue the, the clean energy goals that the Washington legislature has mandated. And, uh, you know, they that should be enough for them to, to, to make the transformation that we're asking for. And in previous uh, presentations, it looks like they were going to be pretty close. Uh, maybe a, maybe the cost would be a little bit over, but uh, and and that's bad. Whenever it's over, it means they don't have to do it. So it's one of those off ramps that Neil was talking about. But yesterday they cho showed a an updated uh, graph that shows they're just really not going to be able to meet the uh, Clean Energy Transformation Act goals. Uh, so, you know, they'll, they'll do what they can, but then as soon as they reach that 2% cost cap, then they just give up. And the, the, uh, the result of that will be that they don't, they don't get to where they're going. And this is on the electric side. So they're not even, it doesn't seem like they're even trying that hard on the gas side, but the electric side, we had some hope. And yesterday uh, we got very worried that they're they're just going to blast through the the cost caps and then and then uh, take the off ramp. So um, it's it, there's a lot of work to do. The PSE has a long ways to go to uh, to meet the the environmental expectations that the state has set, um, and it's just it's discouraging to think that they they may may not make it. So uh, just thought I'd update everybody on that. Thanks, Don. And we did have some other questions with that. I don't see any hands raised. Oh, we see Wayne over there. We'll get to you in just a second. I just want to highlight a question that had already come in and Neil partially answered it. It was about how far do the um, do the toxic emissions go from the facility, knowing that like with the Tacoma LNG, there's residents about a mile away. And um, there's been some general measuring around how far like frack, how far the health impacts go with fracking. But with the Tacoma LNG specifically, frankly, the answer is they didn't bother to study it, um, which is really unfortunate. When, when big projects like this are permitted, there is currently nothing in our state law that says we have to um, analyze what the health impacts are to nearby communities, which is pretty criminal and something that frankly, a lot of us never would have thought of because we, I know for myself before I learned that, I assumed that they would have to do it. Um, and that's one of the things that we need to change. There was, um, Jamie talked about one of the take action items being to show up for the new rules for fossil fuels. And that's where we can advocate really hard that you can't, t you can't actually separate greenhouse gas emission harm from public health harm because, you know, it has, it has kind of both harmful pieces in there. So um, as we're worried about those public health impacts, um, that is a big chance for us to act on that and make sure that those impacts are at least getting analyzed. Let me get you unmuted there, Wayne. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, thank you. I, I was just uh, typing in my question or comment being uh, they found here in Thurston County that uh, Lacey, Olympia and Tumwater have gone with the, the PSE Green Direct program uh, that's set up for, that PSE has set up for large use customers and uh, that uh, the Skookum Chuck um, wind farm has opened up for first of November. Uh, and then also the Kittitas field of, of a solar farm being opened up in, in springtime of which they'll be getting their power. But it appears what PSC is doing is uh, they're not building it themselves. They're not putting any cap of their own capital into it. They're just buying that power from the third party, which both of those are, are uh, Southern energy uh, the company, one of the large ones of the, of the Southeast that's doing the actual building. Um, so so uh, it's just sort of a PSE is just a pass through in terms of just not putting their own capital into long term, you know, what would be a, an easy expense in terms of building their own assets. Is that how, how you all feel and uh, what you've talked about before? Uh, this is the first time I've been on this, uh, this chat. Do we have any presenters excited to answer that one? I apologize. I was responding to people in the chat and I missed part of the question.
it's a little beyond my knowledge. Does anyone else have a, a response to that? I have to admit, I, I was I was catching up with some of the chat stuff too. Could, could you could you give me just a a, a two sentence recap of, of your question? When you're on mute. Okay, my, my question being is, is the um, PSC, is this sort of overall, their, their program appears that what I've seen here in Thurston County is that um, the green direct program that PSC offers in terms of getting 100% renewable energy to uh, large customers, including municipalities uh, for reduced rates, um, that what they're doing is just buying it from some other source that they're not putting their own money into building solar farms or wind farms. They're just buying it from somebody else. So um, is this, is, have, has anybody seen this in other areas that, uh, that uh, a, a number of municipalities, I think Bellingham and you know, others have, have also done, gone or bought into this program. But considering okay, yeah. that that solar power and and uh, at utility scale solar and wind farms are now like twenty percent cheaper than natural gas, um, it's just amazing that that PSE is able to get away with this and and just charge us whatever rates they end up you know their their purchase price plus whatever eight percent or whatever their return is on wherever their sources are, no yeah, fair. Sure. So historically, I think you're. I think you're correct. Is that that program uh, hasn't really shifted their their energy mix much at all? So I'm I'm I I, uh, I participate in their residential program and have for oh more than a decade. I've been paying you know a little extra to make my electrons clean, but that doesn't matter if they're overall you know if if they were creating a solar and wind infrastructure to to boost the, the their energy by the amount that I'm consuming when I pay for that, then you know I would be hundred percent behind that. But I've watched over the decade and their their uh, percentage of fossil fuels in their mix has ac actually gone up over the decade. Mm -hmm. So all that money that uh, extra money that I was paying, uh, I, I feel like it was it was uh, greenwashing at best, and maybe mm -hmm. something else at worst. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, I, I I think you know I think that PSE is going to start, uh, you, you know, because of uh, this law, they're going to start uh, putting bigger investments into wind and solar, and I think you're going to see announcements about that, and they're going to start looking. They're going to play that for everything it's worth. They're going to, you know, they're going to be, oh, you know, we're a leading uh, utility in the country as far as these things go. Well, uh, just take it with a grain of salt because uh, I, I think there's a lot of things they could be doing that they're not. And the reason they're slow walking some of this stuff is because, uh, you know, a lot of their profits come from the gas side of their business and they want to preserve that. Uh, so, uh, color me a, a, a bit of a skeptic on those. I wish it was different because, you know, I, I'm happy to pay more for clean energy uh, if it was making a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Wayne. And we'll, um, we'll hop over to Tiffany in just a moment. I see your hand raised there, Tiffany. Um, and I just want to acknowledge something else that was typed in as just more of a comment in the chat. And that's that, um, you know, hydro, uh, something that, that we have a lot of our power come from in Washington, that, that you know, it's not a perfect power source as it exists now in that um, there's definitely some different harms that have come from the dams that are used. And um, one of the great things about public utility districts is that the people who end up getting elected are able to help have a say in where their power comes from and what ways. So potentially, um, as we can get PUDs and get more of a say in where that power comes from, we can look into um, trying to use hydro in a way that is not causing any harm to communities or salmon or orcas. Um, so yes, thank you for that acknowledgement. 
And let me go ahead and get you unmuted. Oops, your hand raised. No, it's hard to find you. Give me one second. Perfect. You should be able to unmute now, Tiffany. Okay, I put a couple of questions in the chat. I don't remember what the first one was, but the second one was about, I read something about uh, fossil fuel, an industry part of the PR is to connect it to rugged individualism, the wildcatters and um, entrepreneurials and things like that. Uh, what would be your recommendations to kind of um, to counter that? I mean, I've read in like Michael Lewis's The Fifth Risk, fossil fuels are very much propped up by um, government as most scientific research is. Um, so what would be um, your response? Anyway. I, I'm really curious to hear what other people have to say about this. Add one addition to that is that I was reading um, about PSE's advertising and they're also targeting suburban college educated women as the people that would be most on the fence um, about gas right now. And so I don't know how that plays with rugged individualism, but I'd be curious to hear answers that relate to both PSE specifically and rugged individualism as gas as a whole. Yeah, I'll, I'll hop in for a minute too um, around rugged individualism as, as a whole in, in general is, um, you know what, I guess what we end up finding the more, um, the more that we're willing to kind of look oppression and racism in the eye is that rugged individualism is going to be attached to that um, to some degree, um, you know, because really in this country, we, we say there's that rugged individualism for everyone. But in reality, I think that um, that most or all of us are, are aware that in reality, um, that's not something that's really as um, as allowed by our country um, to actually take shape for for everyone. And so when we look at at things where it promotes self above all, um, you know, that's where it's OK to make your air cleaner by poisoning another community. We're not going to be able to get off of those things. If rugged individualism is is kind of the the key of what we're following, then we're going to continue to have sacrifice zones like Tacoma, where it's okay to shove all of these toxic projects. And so, like for me, I, I think that that's something to think through. And I know that for a lot of people, that's very tied into you know American ideals. And so, if that's kind of something for you, that this is kind of an edge where it's like, ooh, I don't know about that. Um, maybe try to look up some other sources. Um, um, around kind of kind of digging into digging into those themes and and some of the harm that that those those themes of self above all else can really can really bring for us. I don't know if any other panelists want to jump in on that. Otherwise, we have um, some other questions in the chat that we want to jump back into there. Um, we just have a couple minutes. Um, one of the other one of the other things that I saw kind of brought up in here a couple of times was kind of like, well, okay, how are we going to stop Tacoma then? <laughs> and also can governor Inslee do anything about PSE? So those are, those are a couple that I'd love for us to dig into for just a moment also. And um, as far as doing something else about Tacoma LNG, I do really encourage everyone to show up next week because we're talking about indigenous sovereignty and pipeline politics. So that's what next Thursday's topic is on. So we are going to dig a ton into Tacoma LNG and just kind of how some of those pipeline things work. And also that um, that event on the 21st by the conversation is has an amazing lineup of speakers. So that'll be another place to learn more. And also in the take action that links that'll be in the resource doc, there's several, um, there's several ways to speak out about the Tacoma facility and outreach and say things on social media to say that you stand with Puyallup against the facility. So we definitely have some links for those things. Check out that resource doc. It's awesome. And, um, and then as we get to Governor Inslee, um, there's there's definitely um, an unfortunate lack of action on the Tacoma LNG specifically. He did come out and say that he can no longer in good conscience support the construction, but his statement was based purely on understanding better the greenhouse gas impacts of using methane, of using fracked gas. He has, to my knowledge, in no way actually publicly acknowledged in any way that the Puyallup tribe's rights are kind of 
you know, part of this equation that there's that there was a that the tribe put out formal stop work requests when that work was going on before they had their permit. Um, it's something that he has seemed to kind of run from and he um, He's basically said that he didn't think it was his job to make sure that the treaties were enforced, but he is our top executive branch of the state. And just something to keep in mind with treaties is that they are a two sided agreement. So a treaty is not just something that belongs to a tribe, a treaty also belongs to the other government body involved. So as US citizens, as Washington state residents, we should care whether that treaty is upheld. So it's something that we should all care about and it should be kind of all of our jobs to try and push um, for those things to be honored in deep, real and meaningful ways. And on a larger scale, um, as far as Governor Inslee forcing PSE to make changes in general, um, there's one thing he did do recently that was great about that is that he recognized how terrible and controversial <laughs> the data that was used in both the Tacoma LNG facility and the Kalama methanol facility using science from over a decade ago, um, using some crazy numbers, some, some weird liquid, leakage rates that are below everywhere else on the planet. Um, and so recognizing that, that's actually what helped to get us um, this comment period that's coming up for new rules for fossil fuels. So we want to take advantage of that and we are really excited about greenhouse gases. Um, I don't know if any of the other um, folks on the panel want to jump in around either of those topics. Okay, and I know we're we're already a little past our 7:15. I know we got <laughs> a lot of people still interested. Um, let's see, was there any last pressing questions that anybody had? I want to thank everybody again um, so much for being with us and encourage you to show up for um, for our next two Thursday night meetings. Like we said, this next one is gonna be on um, around pipeline politics and indigenous sovereignty. And our final one, um, the Thursday after that on the 25th is going to be solely focused for the most part on solutions and helping you take action on some of the things that we've thrown into those take action items. Uh, so that one will be really interactive and, um, and help, help, help make sure that you're able to take action. So, uh, maybe we'll drop the resources link into the chat one more time, but that'll also get emailed out to everybody sometime over the next couple of days. You'll get a little follow up email with a bunch of the links and all the good stuff. And for anybody that's not sure how to do it, you can actually also copy the chat before you leave. If you have the chat open, there's three little dots down on the bottom. And if you click on those, one of the options is save chat and that will save the chat to your computer. If you want to have all of the links right there without even waiting or all the cool stuff that everybody else was dropping in the chat. All right, well then we'll go ahead and close this out and let's see. Perfect, we got lots of thank yous coming in. We appreciate everybody being on here with us and we hope to see everybody next week. Thanks so much, everybody.